And welcome everybody to this week's Zoominar. Today we have Arnaldo Cruz as a guest. Uh, Arnaldo has been for the last 17 years, he's been, he's worked in government, private and nonprofit sectors, and he's always focused on using data to evaluate programs and, uh, and also information technology uh, to do this. So he's, he's in our world in, in some sense. He's worked, at, he's worked for the US Census, the Mayor's Office Workforce Development um, in Chicago. He's been the chairman of the board for the Puerto Rico Institute of Statistics. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that maybe today. And he's uh, an adjunct professor in the Sacred Heart University in Puerto Rico in the business school there. And he's currently the director of the research and policy uh, a group in the for the Financial Oversight and Management Board for Puerto Rico, of Puerto Rico. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But he's also the co-founder of this is how I first uh, heard about Arnaldo. He's the co-founder of Abre Puerto Rico, which is an organization dedicated to promoting data driven decisions in Puerto Rico. And it has done quite some impressive things that we'll also talk about today. So welcome Arnaldo. Uh, and thanks for agreeing to talk to us. Great, uh, thanks Thanks for the invite. Uh, I'm very excited to talk about this topic, which I'm very passionate uh, about. Yeah. So thank you for the invite. Great, and for the uh, for those of you, who, I think we have some new, new uh, audience members this week, given the topic being a little bit different than usual. Uh, if you have questions, you can use the Q&A uh, section and you can ask anything you want. And I'll, uh, if we have time, I'll, I'll ask Arnaldo um, and we'll discuss it. Okay, so uh, the first, to so one of the things, the, the main thing I wanted to talk about today, the general topic is is the use of statistics and data and computational tools in, in government and in, in policy decisions, which is, is used more than people realize. Now, that's not, I don't think that's true in Puerto Rico, at least relative to other jurisdictions, at least in the United States. And, and I'm hoping you can shed some light into that. So I think it'll be interesting to talk about this topic because we have, um, it's a it's a place where we, we can, I think a lot can get better simply by doing something that's, you know, it's almost, it's very low cost uh, and, and can have a much bigger impact than, than people realize. So so the first thing I wanna do is is just to share with maybe some of our audience that aren't necessarily aware of how much, how, how impactful data can be in, in, in policy making. If you can share some examples that you think are, are good examples of, of how that works. Yeah, so, uh, you know, data is being used everywhere uh, right now for decision making and not just in the government, but in the private sector as more data has become available and uh, through, you know, uh, through the harnessing what what people are doing and tracking what people are doing, information has become uh, very critical for decision making, particularly in the private sector, in the government. Uh, although there's been a lot of innovation in, in data techniques and data analysis in the private sector, the government has, in, not just in Puerto Rico, but across you know, the world and in the States has lagged behind the private sector in harnessing data for decision making. Uh, but but you know, not, there are good examples of governments that have been able to utilize data to uh, prioritize uh, you know, financial decisions and resources, right? I mean, governments have limited resources, so um, they, a lot of governments have been able to use information to prioritize uh, where to, for example, where to look for uh, potential people that could be eligible for Medicaid, right? And could, could receive that service and you understand demographics and use census data, and use all the type of data to identify those populations that are currently not being served and could have a high impact if they are able to receive a particular service or uh, governments have been able to uh, use information to uh, prepare there for hurricanes and be able to identify vulnerable populations of vulnerable areas and then plan accordingly and minimize the impact of a natural disaster. That has been another application that has been uh, utilized uh, in different governments that have you know, natural disaster as, as, a, as a recurrent uh, problem. And then you know, there's been a, a tendency of using what you know, our economists 
app called Nudge, which is how do you uh, incentivize people to make decisions that they wouldn't otherwise make on their own. And uh, governments have been able to, you know, use the, the you know, the, the, the concept of nudging to uh, have people, uh, you know, um, make, uh, have more compliance with, with tax uh, returns and, um, or make decisions about, for teachers uh, improving their attendance at schools by uh, providing information of, you know, attendance records of in their school relative to other schools. So in, in governments have been, uh, although they're lagged behind the private sector, they, they have definitely, there's good examples of how being, some governments have been able to utilize information to make better decisions and improve outcomes uh, and government programs. Yeah, but yeah, the other one I've, I've heard was a big one, although this might be a little controversial today is, is policing. Right. So, so there was a big drop in crime in New York from in the 90s. And some people attribute that to the use of data to send police to where the crime was, which seems kind of obvious, but it wasn't necessarily done because I just didn't know, um, didn't know. And that, that did, that, I mean, it dropped dramatically, dropped like something like, I don't know what it is, 80% since the 90s, uh, making New York one of the safest cities in the, in the United States or the world, uh, relatively speaking. Um, so, the in the case of Puerto Rico, why why it's it, as, as we already discussed, it seems to be a little bit behind in this regard. Uh, it doesn't. It seems so. I've been working, as maybe you know, but I've been working to help the the Department of Health there track the track, trying to figure out how to how to summarize and track the the COVID pandemic, and I've been surprised at how behind they were they're much better now there was like this transformation during during the pandemic where they brought in this group and they just kind of start fixing things putting things in a database there was not there wasn't really they weren't even using databases and 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 organized information uh it was done through a lot of it was done through spreadsheets being you know kept and mailed around it was quite it's quite surprising to me that they was so kind of behind do you know would you have a sense of why first is that widespread throughout the entire government and second is it what is it why is why is it because what is why do you think that is why don't why don't why don't people catch up i mean the technology exists the expertise is out there why aren't we using it so yeah it, it is spread across the government and excel uh in in you know best case scenario is the main uh database um, at best and then at worst you have you know um, paper based paper? systems <laughs> yes yes uh, paper based systems or you know email as a way to collecting information and so it's 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 really the state of uh, information technology as it relates to data the, the state of uh, data as a as a tool for making decisions is is really bad across the board and so it's, so your experience in the department of health is it's very, you know, it doesn't surprise me because it's very common. Uh, Let me email him and, and text him so, um, so he knows he's frozen. So the other thing I was going to ask him about is about this organization that he started called Abre. And the, the organization is, is a nonprofit. I'm, I'm asking, I'm going to ask him how, what it motivated to, to start it and what, um, and how would they achieve what they achieve, but they're, they're basically trying to get information however they can from the government and then sharing it um, with, with the public. So the first one they did was quite interesting. So, so, and first you'll be surprised, some of you that know how policy works in, in Puerto Rico, you'll be surprised that this wasn't, this wasn't like something that's just publicly available. And in Puerto Rico has 78 small towns, municipalities they're called uh, each one with their own governance structure. So they'll have, they'll, each one has a mayor and, and they have you know, the mayor's office and, and they control things, they control some services in the town. So that, that's 78 in a pretty small island, it's a lot. But so, they, they don't all seem to work very well. It's not clear how the funding is used. Um, and it's just so how do you know which one is is working which one isn't and one thing i've seen this organization do is they they somehow got their hands on 
the, the financial data for each town, they analyze it, and then they, they give each, they, they have some, some, some methodology um, to, to give each one a, 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 a grade. Of course, there's probably some number behind it, and then they publish it. So you have all these, um, yeah, it looks like his internet's gone. <laughs> we, we might, um, might call him on the phone and see how we can make that work. Um, so, so that's, that's been a very interesting thing that they've done. So now every year they publish, uh, the, the finance, the finances for, for each town. And now, now it, what, the, what positive effect this could have is that you, you can have, it could pressure, uh, municipalities to, to act better, especially those that have been exposed as being, uh, using their funding in, you know, in their, their, their funds in a way that isn't, isn't the most efficient. The other, the other project I saw them do was that they, and again, this, I think this is public in most states, it is in Massachusetts, and it's the scores that the, each school, each public school gets in a, um, in a, uh, I think he's back. Are you back? Yeah. In each, uh, each school, what, te what test the, the average, you can't give each student's test, but you can give them you can give the, the, the average and the standard deviation, for example, for each school. So that gives you an idea of the performance. I mean, some people will claim that tests aren't really measuring much. We'll, we'll discuss this with Arnaldo. So, sorry, I, I... Oh, it's okay. No, that's okay. We, so what I did was I just, so you don't have to explain it because I, I explained Abre and how it, use, it, yeah. it, it uses, uh, uh, it got its hands on, on, on the finances of each town and 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 put that in the public which puts a puts pressure on the mayors especially the ones that get an f yes so uh, so so i want to i mean i already told the audience a little bit about it so you don't have to go over it again but i do want to know how that what, what was it inside the organization how did you get that like it, it's not on the internet yeah so um and sorry about the internet uh it is what, what it is under this new world um <laughs> so uh, like you know, like you said, we are a transparency NGO, and we had this initial idea to uh, to understand municipal finances in Puerto Rico. In Puerto Rico, there's 78 municipal hey. departments, and we were surprised to hear that each when you hear a mayor in you know talking in when they're giving their annual address, they everything is fine. They always have uh, a surplus, and finances are fine. And we were like, it's not possible that. All 78 municipal governments have a surplus, so um, so something has to, you know, something's not right here. So we went online and we couldn't find the financial statements, which is, uh, you know, a, a, a document that's audited by a CPA firm that, you know, states the, you know, financial condition of of, uh, of a municipality. So we couldn't so, find. So it. that has to happen by law, right? They have to get that done. Yes. But it's, yes. But it's not true that by law it has to be public. No, so the, yeah, so so there is a regulation by the controller that they're supposed to uh, put that information accessible to the public. It's not very specific what accessible means. So accessible could mean that they are it's you know in in their city hall that you can go and get it. You know, but it's not very specific about because when the regulation was written, it was you know internet was not as you know prevalent at the time. So um, so when we talked to the the controller we have a controller here and and she said hey i i have the information because they have to submit the information to me and I we see. have a bunch of boxes so you know you can you know you can come and get the boxes uh and you can get the information so we have to physically go to the controller's office to oh get God. 78 uh financial statements these are you know documents of uh, over 100 pages uh, in English, so we had we had to um, since they were not available on the internet, we scanned them and we posted on our website. So that was like step number one. Okay, so now the financial statements are on the website, um, and again, so so that was the first step. So when we did that, not many people went to the website because you know it, it's not like you know a lot of people can understand a financial statement and read a hundred pages. So we decided, okay, so let's let's do something different. Let's create the data. From the financial statement, put it in Excel, and upload the Excel file so people can use the data. So that was our second step, and we did that, and we uploaded the Excel sheet with all the data. We had a bunch of interns come in and scrape the data from these documents and upload that into our website. 
But then we found out that even having the Excel file with you know the hundreds and hundreds of lines of scraped data was not getting a lot of attention. People were not using the information because it's still complicated financial information that not a lot of people understand um, and could utilize the information easily. So that's where we decided, oh, we need to create some sort of uh, analytical tool or index that could transform all that data in a way that could be accessible and understandable to the common person. So we took all that data, we developed a proprietary index. Um, we use about 13 indicators. We gave it different weights to different indicators and we created one index and we ran a distribution uh, and we assigned grades to the mayors uh, based on how they did in the index. And we created a portal uh, where citizen can go and check uh, the citizen can check all the detail, right, if they want to, but they can also see, you know, easily my mayor has an A, B, C, D, or F. And, know, we, that, and that got attention real oh, quick. Yeah, that got attention <laughs> and that got a lot of death threats. <laughs> and from Really you know, death threats? You're serious? Uh, or we, you're... We, we got, you know, uh, not death threats, but we got very nasty emails from, from mayors and from staff at, at some of the municipal governments that were threatening about this information and they were not threatening when we scanned the documents they were not they didn't care much when we scraped the data and we uploaded the data to a website it's so when we created the grades and it, the index got a lot of popularity and and there's a lot of citizens went and to the website to check the grade and the citizens went back to the mayor saying oh you know you have an f you have an e, a d and that's what created uh you know a lot of mayors not being happy with being well, assigned. I know the very popular mayor of San Juan got an F, no, or a D. Yeah. So uh, then so she we, got better. Then it got better. He got better. So <laughs> we have, we the Avre have been doing this for now for six years. So the index is constructed in a way that you know it, we check the fiscal year. A new data comes in, and so the, a, a municipality can change its ranking, and then it's great based on new data. So. Uh, we have had some municipal governments that that got an F in the first year. And now they're, you know, uh, around the C, B level. So there's there's been it has been an effective tool to incentivize good perf financial performance. And what's what's an example of that? Like, what do they do that makes it like? Give me an example of what a, a town did to to get their grades up that actually translates into into it being better for the citizens. Yeah, so one thing that we do is that since since there's 13 indicators, um, it, we rank uh, the municipal government each indicator. So uh, municipal government can see uh, if I have a D, which indicators are dragging my grade down. So um, mayors that, you know, that were, and they talk to us, you know, that some of them that were nice about it, they came to us and they asked us to explain their, their grade. They could see which of the indicators were dragging their grade and they focus on those uh, specifically uh, in the upcoming years in order to improve their ranking. So uh, municipal government that, for example, um, had a, a, a deficiency in revenues over expenditures uh, as a percentage of their budget, they could see that that one particularly was dragging. So they started, you know, reducing their costs or increasing their revenue in order to close the gap and then not have a deficiency at the end of the year. And so if you don't have a deficiency, you have a surplus that increases your likelihood of increasing the ranking. So it, so the tool, you know, at the beginning, we got a lot of heat from the mayors, but over the years, uh, we have received some good, um, uh, you know, Feedback. some mayors have come to us uh, asking for for guidance on how they can improve their grades. So you know it's been around for six years. So it it so it sort of has become a standard uh, measurement for municipal finance in Puerto Rico so far. Interesting. And is it is it on a curve? Is there always going to be an F, or can everybody get an A eventually? No, it's on a curve. So oh, it's, it, so there it, always be an F. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's all relative to your your peers. So okay, okay. Um, I mean, and and there's there's been some criticism for statisticians um, around grading on a curve and and being all relative right because if I yeah, if yeah. I if I improve individually but my peers are improving to a greater degree I still are behind the curve so I mean there's 
so that's a, 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 a legitimate criticism to the index that that you know th there there's other ways we can do the the distribution of grades, uh, but that's we have found that that's the most uh, you know fair and standard way of doing it so far. But we welcome new ways of doing it, of course. So, well, you, yeah, you could give them an, how much you improved grade too. So that's one one easy way out of that. So how do, and how do you now do you still have to go get those boxes or is it now getting put into a database? No. So the information, the state, the financial statements are now online. Um, the government, after we uh, did the scanning and uploading to our website, uh, maybe a year and a half later, the government started um, uh, doing it on their own. So and this is sort of like a, another example of where you can incentivize action uh, from a government entity without asking, but actually doing it. And, and, and the action of Avare at the time forced the government to, to do it on their own. So that's a, that's that's a, good, it's a good example of, of positive impact. That's great. I didn't know that part. That's great. Yeah. yeah. So, so how about the school? So the other thing, I couldn't believe you got that data when I first <laughs> saw it. Like, so, so the, 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 what is it? It's like, I hear they call it MCAST. It's like every year students get tested um, and then each school, you can see what average the school got. Uh, yeah. They have other things like differences between between social groups and all whatever. But but at the end of the day, you could see this school performed this, this person that and they got better, they got worse. But until you until Abre did this we in Puerto Rico, you couldn't know. So so and, and I'll, one of the th other things they did, which I thought was really smart, is that they compared I'm talking about Abre now, you all compared the the scores to the grades and it was like there was no correlation between the grades, the GPA yeah. of a school and the scores, which was telling us that there's this total grade inflation. Yeah. Um, nice. So, yeah. So how did you, I, I mean, tell you can tell us a little more that if I left anything out, but also I'm more interested in how you actually convinced whoever it was to give you that data. And it, so and here it's public, by the way. Yeah, so it, it wasn't it wasn't easily accessible before um, in the internet, but but this is this is one of the lessons learned of doing this. You know, you start at when we started this at Avare with the founders, it was sort of more like a maverick. Uh, you know, we were young at the time and we were demanding information to be online and being sort of maverick about it. And you know, through all the years, you learn that uh, if you want good data and if you want recurrent data, you need to establish a good relationship with the agency for two reasons. First, even if if you go, you know, very forceful to an agency asking for the information, they give you the data. This is information you're gonna want in a recurrent basis. So if you don't, if you if you don't establish that trust and that relationship that you you get it once but then if you want to get it again then you're going to have to go through the same process so so the first thing is that we needed to develop a relationship with the department with the department staff to earn their trust uh to give us the information and to ensure they could give us the information on a recurring basis the second thing why you need a collaboration with the agency and you know this working with the department of health every time you get data from a government entity you're going to have a bunch of questions about the data, right? And if you don't have a relationship with the agency, good luck getting those answers, right? So we were very, with everything that Abre has done, we have been very careful on not just doing, give, they give us data and we just put it out without checking to see, you know, how do they get this data? How do they manage the data? And, and sure, some, there are some minimal data quality issues. So um, the relationship with the agency allowed us to to. To, to, you know, to go through a process of iterations. Every time they gave us data, we had a, several questions about what, it, how do they interpret this data? How do they collect this data? How do they create this statistic? Um, and that uh, allow us then to be in a better position to utilize the information for statistical purposes. So, um, so it was a couple of months process. It wasn't like we asked for the information they gave us to us. It, it was like several months talking to the agency head and the agency staff, and we were able to establish that relationship that allowed allow them to give us the data and allow us to get all the answers we needed. So in the process, we got some data that we ended up not using because it, you know, it didn't meet the minimum standards of quality. We were unsure how they created the, 
the statistic. They, they were unsure themselves of the quality of the data that they were getting. So um, there was a bunch of data that they gave us and we ended up you know, not using in the index. So once we narrow down, this is the type of data that's suitable for statistical purposes, we create an index for the schools and we grade the schools, right? Um, and and then we created a- But I'm sorry for the school, isn't it? I mean, you just have this number, right? You Don't you yeah. just have the average of, of, the, of math and reading or- No, so what we did is, it was interesting about the, and this is everywhere in all school districts, um, the proficiency level uh, is different in every grade. As you go into more mm -hmm. grades, the proficiency level goes down. So we were, uh, so we oh, developed see. a methodology that, and then we have an issue here that, you know, you have, you don't have, uh, you, you don't have a very balanced uh, uh, categories of schools. So you have, you know, K four schools, K five schools, K K six. K7 and so forth, so forth. So it was unfair for us to compare a proficiency of a K9 school with a K5 because K5 was gonna have a higher proficiency because of, you know, they have students that, that are lower grades. So we designed it in a way that a school, uh, a K12 school was gonna receive three scores, right? One for K6, K6 schools uh, and then Interme intermediate and then high school grades. So that allow us to have a fair comparison between the different compositions of schools. So, um, so we created this portal and, and the portal went viral because, I mean, we were on, the, when we started this project, we had, a, we heard a lot of people saying, ah, oh, that's a waste of time. Parents don't care about education or the school. Yeah, that's what we heard. And, and this came from some academics locally. <laughs> So, you, you, you know, it was, um, you know, uh, unfortunate comments, but, but when we did this, the, and we launched the portal, it went viral. Um, we got over 150,000 visits um, of mostly parents that were checking their, their school grade for the first time in a way that could understand what this meant. Now we were heavily criticized and we, you know, everything that Avri has done had received a lot of criticism. Uh, from different people. So we were criticized because we, a lot of our indicators were based on, you know, SAT scores, uh, uh, you know, standardized tests and, and some, you know, some indicators that, are, you know, some people believe that are not fair way of, of judging uh, performance in the school. And that's a fair criticism, but that's the only data that we were able to utilize because the other data that we, we got in other uh, dimensions of the school, it, it wasn't suitable for statistical purposes. So we decided not to use it. And although we try to explain many times that we try to have a more holistic uh, tool for parents, we just didn't have all it's the It's not data. perfect. It's the, don't let the, the perfect be the enemy of the good. Yeah. So, um, so that was- can a, I, can I, I want to yeah. defend your approach right now to, uh, I'm an academic, so I'll talk to other academics. <laughs> Yeah, please. <laughs> so here's what I see it. Yeah, it's not perfect. Of course not. But it's pretty objective. Whatever it measures, it's objective. Um, you can say that it's subjective, uh, the, the questions that are designed. But once they're set, now it's, it's the test. This, the test, the supposed eighth grade test, Arnaldo Abre showed, correlates with the entry exam to the university strongly. So whatever, whatever it is it's measuring, even you might think it's not just, but whatever it is, the eighth grade test is measuring correlates with the test that's going to be used to let your kid into college, into which college. Maybe you, you think that's unjust too, but that's what's used right now. So you have these, you have people, so, and then at the same time, okay, so that's number one. Number two is then you have grades, which don't correlate yeah. with the entry exam to the university. And if you don't see the problem with that, let me see. I'm trying to explain this to you. So you, to, you have, you're a parent. You're, you know, for what you're. Maybe you're not that educated. You trust the school. Your school, the school is telling you your kid has A's, straight A's, for the entire their entire life, straight A's, straight A's. And then they go and take the college exam, and they fail it. You think that's right? Then, then we, I'm going to disagree with that. You know, that eighth grade exam is what. You should should have been a warning. You should all those A's that were given to the to your kid were lies, and that eighth grade exam was a predictor. 
And no one until Abra came along, no one was saying what that eighth grade score was. And now we do know. And that's why it went viral. It's because parents want to know what's, you know, is my kid going to do well in the in the entrance exams of college? Just as just to keep it super simple. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I just it, it just and, and and we we when we before we did the index because we were asked by many people to include include the school grades and uh, we were hesitant because when we did the analysis that's when we found that there were there was no correlation not even weak correlation between grades and proficiency levels and we found schools that had around 85 percent of the students getting a's and b's with less than 20 percent being proficient so there were some huge gaps um and again we 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 understand that the standardized tests are not perfect and there's other ways to to measure uh, a student outcomes and student performance and school performance and that's uh, we agree with that but at the time that's the only data that we have that could be utilized and all we did was organize the information in a way for a parent to understand what this meant now but can i just say real quick yeah. before you you just give you know just yeah. concede that point it yeah. measures something yeah so if you know if you don't know how to add it'll show up in that test if you don't know how to read, it'll show up in that test. It's not, it's not completely useless. There's something there. It's not perfect, but the, the, it is measuring something. Sorry, go ahead. No, and, and again, we, we've done this a couple years now, um, and this has uh, allowed Avre to get some additional funding. Funding has been very hard for Avre. Avre is a 501c3, um, and it's a non-for-profit, but it's been, the philanthropic uh, ecosystem here it's not very, uh, you know, our, what Aure does is a little more intangible, right? It's more, you know, data for change, right? And that's not a direct service per se. So Aure has had a lot of issues uh, getting funding locally. So fortunately, we have, Aure has had uh, some U.S. foundations support some of the work. So now Aure is going into more deep diving into uh, education. What, what, so we, we the, the new uh, study by Abre that's about to be released, uh, hopefully by early next year, is that we, we use the data, the data from Abre portal, and we did a, 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 a statistical analysis, a geo uh, statistical analysis to find geographically where schools have high performance and low performance, and they have similar profile. So in a, in a town where you know, because they always say, well, you know, the kids don't perform well because they're, they live in a bad neighborhood or, or poverty, but we were able to control for those factors. And even after controlling for poverty level, percentage of special ed uh, students in the school and other uh, size of the school, we still saw in proximity, uh, geographic proximity, we still found that they, they you know, they have big gaps in, in, in student outcomes. So what we did was that we, 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 we went directly to those schools because the data that we have from the district could not allow us to understand causation because the data that was available was just not enough for, for us to do a, a robust statistical model. So we had to go into the schools uh, and get some additional data through surveying parents, surveying teachers, and, and some other information that was not available at the district. So um, in, early next year, Abre is going to release the results of that study. We, we did like five, no, I think six case studies where schools were next to each other um, and have gaps in performance, but uh, those gaps could not be explained by poverty level and those, some of these other factors. Yeah, interesting. But also at the end of the day, so if I'm, if I'm in charge, I want you to tell me that so that I can invest more in those schools that need it more. Right? So if, if I want to know, I don't, I don't want to see all those A's. I want to see their actual performance. And if it's not good, and especially if it's in an underserved community, then more reason to know that they're not performing well so that we can go and help them, you know, spend, I don't know, invest more, whatever we can do to, to help. Great. So that's, that, was, that was very interesting to hear. And, and your, your comments about getting the data in a recurrent form, um, we hear you as a statisticians in academia because we have to do that too. And, and your and being maverick is not always the good way to go. It gets you, uh, it could get you quick fame if you just go after somebody for doing yeah. the analysis wrong. But 
you there's other ways to do it you know you could establish a collaboration and yeah and it takes longer and it might not get you as much fame but it could be more long lasting so we we do see that in our world too the, the fact that you want to work with the people producing the data sometimes no sometimes you actually go after them that's an, <laughs> a topic for another another yeah. zoom in art well what, what we, interesting in Avra, we we did both right and and, and based, after eight years of, of of this type of work uh we found that collaboration was more effective so that i that's that's our experience so far yeah so okay so we, we don't, we're running out of time but i do want to talk about this last topic which is the um the oversight board or the the oversight and management board is the official name so for the audience members that haven't heard of this uh puerto rico basically went bankrupt they the u.s passed a law puerto rico is part of the u.s for those that don't know and in the u.s states can't go bankrupt puerto rico is the kind of like a state that's another topic that we could talk for about an hour but uh it couldn't go bankrupt but they were going to go bankrupt because they took out tons of loans, basically to pay not to pay employees, basically for as far as I can tell, um, not not for investment in infrastructure. So by doing that, they borrow, 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 but didn't grow. So they ended up owing a bunch of money so much that that the the federal government passed a law uh, permitting Puerto Rico to. They don't call it bankruptcy, but it's that's basically what it is. And part of the agreement, just like when, when there's bankruptcy, there's there's a judge and there's a, a group of people that decide who's going to get paid first. And one of the conditions for this to happen was that a board was named that was going to over it was going to provide oversight over the finances. Did I explain that pretty well in one minute? What did I miss? <laughs> no, yes. I mean, it, it's a bankruptcy process. Puerto Rico, by the U.S. law, it's not allowed uh, to access the uh, bankruptcy procedures. So the Congress had to create an ad hoc uh, bankruptcy uh, process for Puerto Rico. And this had turned out to be the biggest uh, bankruptcy in the history of municipal markets, uh, over $70 billion. So the, the board was part of the, uh, of the statute. Um, although some people in Puerto Rico think that this is a very particular to Puerto Rico, there's been oversight boards all over the yeah. state. DC, right? Uh, DC and, DC and one, New York, Detroit, and there's many others that are not as famous as the Detroit and DC ones. But but those are um, all cities. This is a state. Oh. Yeah, yeah, states huh. because states are not allowed to go bankrupt. Uh, so it's most of most of the municipal, uh, all the municipal. Um, uh, bankruptcy proceedings have been either city or public corporations that are within, uh, you know, county, city government. So, so, uh, so yeah. So Arnaldo is the, oh, sorry, your title, official title is on the board is a so, research, so a, yeah, so, research. Yeah. So we, um, this is an approach that, that, you know, we've been talking to the executive director, Nada Yeresco, establishing a, a policy and research department to, uh, do help a couple of things. First, uh, you know, sometimes in this type of work, it's not, you know, it's hard to do research or deep dive on complicated policy issues because, you know, things are always, you know, for yesterday, right? So it's a very, uh, you know, um, sort of transactional type of approach. So uh, the executive director wanted a new department that could take its time uh, and I look see. into several policy issues um, with a more research type of focus. So this is a new department. I'm head of the department and we have a team of economists, uh, you know, the, the PhDs in public administration, attorneys. Um, it's a small uh, department that we have started and we have began to deep dive around various policy issues. Right now, the, the most, um, uh, you know, re not relevant, but the most immediate one that we just launched a couple of research reports was around civil service reform and how do we uh, get uh, civil service reform in Puerto Rico. And I think it is important to clarify that policy analysis is not just data and statistics, right? Um, in order to do policy analysis, you, you need to look into various things, laws and regulations, uh, processes at the agencies, uh, you know, stats and data. So, the department sort of represents that, you know, with all these different backgrounds in the team, that sort of perspective of how do you 
really look into a policy issue and are able to provide recommendations with that sort of comprehensive 360 look at, at a policy issue. And, and the ultimate goal is to is to develop policies that will help Puerto Rico get back on financial yeah. track. Yeah. So obviously, we we want our work to uh, first foster debate about policy, as you know, and you being a, a very you know uh, uh, active in social media. Most of the policy discussing in Puerto Rico is very, it's not based on data, it's not based on analysis. So we, our work is to uh, ensure that whatever, you know, discussion we're having about a policy change is based on sound research and policy analysis. So we're having a discussion around those standards. So that's one thing. So we want to foster evidence-based policy in Puerto Rico. And we also want influence uh, a change in, in policy in Puerto Rico as it relates to, uh, to various issues. And, and the best way we can do it is to uh, do this type of work and work with government uh, to see uh, if there, these are things that the government can, can be inspired to do in order to get Puerto Rico uh, back on, on track. Well, that's, that's not a great position to be in, I got to say, as a statistician, because <laughs> I mean, there people have opinions, ideologies, and they're sure that something's right. And when the data doesn't agree with it, and <laughs> then you're the you're the they shoot the messenger off. And oh, is that has that been your experience a little bit? <laughs> well, in in Abre, I had that experience um, that that you know I, they shoot the messenger with some of this stuff. But uh, in the policy, it's a, it's a new department. We started around May uh, of this year, so it's it's a, sort of like a new thing for in the board. And so far, um, so far, surprisingly, it's been very positive feedback from stakeholders because we have had an approach that not just to put research, we have had open discussions, we have released the data we use for the research, we have engaged with the various sectors around the research we're doing, we are also engaging with the agency, right? And this is part mm -hmm. of the process, so you can't talk about policy change without talking to the government agencies you're researching about because you need their input, you need their data, and you need their feedback into the type of work that you're doing. So surprisingly, so far, um, so far, um, I, we have received a lot of positive feedback from, from the ecosystem, from various stakeholders, which is very encouraging, even though, as you know, the board has, you know, a lot of detractors, you know, from different areas. Mm -hmm. But uh, but so far, uh, you know, we, we have, I, I, at least I have felt that, that our work has been uh, a welcoming thing in, in, in the ecosystem in Puerto Rico. That's great to hear. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Um, well, you know, we're out, out of time, but I can't, I forgot to ask you a question I'm very curious about. So I'm gonna ask it anyways. I hope the audience can uh, bear with us just for a couple more minutes. So you were, you were the chairman of the board for the Puerto Rico Institute of Statistics. And at, at, are, were you the chairman when, when the government tried to 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 the um, to basically dismantle it? Or yeah, so I wasn't the chairman. I was at the board uh, when that occurred. So um, do you know what? So I know that the, actually the American Statistical Association, which is I'm a member of, we actually wrote a statement against the dismantling of the Institute yeah. of Statistics. And I, I guess what I wanted to hear about is what was going on? Like, why did they want to? dismantle that. I never understood the reasoning behind that. Yeah. So uh, fortunately, the courts, uh, you know, the institute at the time sued the, the, the government around uh, dismantling the board of directors. Uh, the, the, the government uh, sort of, there were board of directors that had a term and their term had not expired at the time. And the governor at the time tried to take those uh, directors away without their term expiring and putting some people different people, right? So when that happened, the Institute of Statistics, the, the, you know, sued the executive director at the time, sued the government and the courts sided with the Institute and those members that were uh, sort of taken out by the existing governor were brought back by the courts. Reinstated by the courts. Um, so yeah, so I was in the middle of that process uh, when that happened. Um, so the, the board, while the courts were figuring this out, the local courts, the board was not really meeting or functional. So uh, we were waiting to see what the courts would decide if the governor had the authority to, um, to take some members out that their term had not expired. So, uh, so that happened, the, 
the board, um, um, you know, got reinstated. Uh, some of the board members, uh, ex they had their term expire and they were replaced uh, by the governor, uh, the same governor that, that, that tried to, this, you know, take them away. But, but the law, you know, stated that it's the governor's, you know, role to appoint the members. So when the, the members expire their term, then the governor named new members. So, so, um, okay. But, but I guess what I'm more curious about is why would, why would they be against the existence of an Institute of Statistics? Or maybe, maybe that was exaggerated in the, in the press. Yeah, so they, um, the governor never uh, was very clear about his intention, um, and and I was at the time I was against the, you know, the the actions of the governor because the members that the the governor was taking out of the board were had not had not done anything wrong, so mm -hmm. there was no reason to take them out. So um, there was really no, uh, you know, a good reason to. To do so, the governor should have, you know, waited until the, the term expired to name the people that the law gives, you know, the law does give the governor that power, but the governor should have waited for those terms to expire. Um, okay. So, I mean, I, I guess, you know, the Institute has functioned as an autonomous and independent entity. And, yeah. you know, that that's a very unique um you know, thing for a government entity in Puerto Rico. And I, and I guess, you know, the, sometimes their governors uh, have issues with that. Okay. All right. All right. Well, thanks, Arnaldo. This was really interesting and insightful. Keep up the good work. And if you need any, I mean, it doesn't look like you do, but if you need any statistical or data analysis help, I We always do. We have people. We have people that do. can, and I, and I want to work. And I appreciate, uh, I know you collaborated with the Institute uh, in the selection of our new executive director. We, we, we appreciate a lot of your help. So uh, at the board, we are, uh, at the oversight board, we, we're always looking to collaborate. So um, we don't have all the resources in the world in the department. So um, we certainly uh, will be looking at the statistical community if we, uh, if we need some help with some more complex uh, statistical analysis for policy. All right, excellent. Well, thanks again. Well, this is going to cut off now. There's there's no other way to do it. So I saw bye and, and we'll chat again soon, hopefully. Bye, everybody. Thanks for joining.